come together, that is the coming together of the body of Christ. And uh, if you want to see the body of Christ today, uh, you don't need to look at uh, a, a cross with him being crucified. Just look at each other when we're having church service. Amen. That's the body of Christ. And uh, so remember, when you are uh, uh, talking bad to somebody in the church, you know, you're talking bad to the body of Christ. So anyway, thank you for coming today. I want to uh, ask you to prepare your tithes and your offerings, and we will ask the blessing over this tithes and offerings, and then we will get into what the Lord is revealing to us, to us today. We are in the last days, and in the last days, we need to encourage each other. We need to warn each other, and we need to constantly be checking our own lives so that we don't get caught up in deception and fall in the same pit and snares that uh, we've seen so many uh, do. So uh, let's just open up with a word of prayer. Ms. Peg, if you'd just pray over this offering and ask the Lord to bless this uh, meal today, and then we'll go right into a worship song by our very own uh, brother Bob over there at the piano. So thank you, Bob Light up. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise as we come into your presence, Lord. And we do come with praise and with grateful hearts, Father. We just love you so much, Lord God. And I and, uh, just want you to know that we are blessed by you, just who you are in our lives and what you've done for us and the price that you paid. So yes, Lord, we have a grateful heart. And we just want you to know that, Lord God. And, and Father, we just ask that you bless the meal that we're that's prepared, that you prepared tonight, Lord, Father, that we would eat, and Lord God, that even if it goes down sweet, Lord God, and it could be better if there's bitterness, yes, Lord, Lord God, yes. it's all the same, and it, you, we know, Father, that you give us the nourishment, Lord yes, God, Lord. and we so look forward to that, Lord God. We ask that you bless the gathering of the saints here, Lord, yes, yes. those that are watching, ask that you bless the offering and the tithes, Lord God. We just give you praise and love and glory in ever, forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. Of your power, 
love and purity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. You are God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Holy are you, Lord Almighty. 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 Holy are you. Lord Almighty, and you alone are God. Give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you, Brother Bob. Thank you, Brother Bob. Thank you, Lord. I tell you what, the Lord is here tonight. He's here to meet our needs. He is here to lift us up, to empower us to lift him up. So thank you for that song. Man, we could just easily just keep going. <laughs> it could have stayed in that. We go, we're going to get back into that here uh, at the end of the service here around, uh, oh, I say uh, uh, in about 30 minutes. And, I want to get back into uh, prayer and to worship here. I want to go back to the, the purpose uh, for my mes message a couple of weeks ago in talking about the end times. And it is literally, the purpose is to, uh, is to get us to readjust our views in life and get back to a biblical worldview. Uh, the, the body of Christ has a great need for this. And you can't say that you don't because there is no way that our nation can get in the shape it's in without somebody in the body of Christ, the, the majority of those in the body of Christ, <clears throat> moving from a biblical worldview to a secular worldview. We can't get into a secular worldview condition if the uh, bulk of the body of Christ is walking in a biblical worldview. And if we are living a biblical worldview, we would not be in the condition that we're in. So my job as a pastor, and what I feel God putting, in, putting on my heart in this hour, and one of the main needs that we have in the body of Christ, now that the body of Christ has been uh, uh, weeded out and really sifted to the point that we know who the body of Christ is. Uh, they tell us that uh, before the pandemic, of all of the people that were going to church for the last year and a half, going, or two and a half years, going on three years, all of those people that were going to church during the pandemic that left, 51% have not returned. 51%. And the majority of that 51%, according to the polls, Barnum's polls, he said, uh, they said, when asked, have you been attending a church online or watching a Christian uh, ministry on TV? And the majority of them said no. 
Well, I submit to you as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who has the responsibility to look at these people and as a doctor would look at a sick patient, draw the conclusion of their sickness by examining them. And my examination of somebody like that is that they never were saved. If you have not pursued God, you got no desire to be with God's people, you got no desire to hear about him, then I am sorry. According to the scriptures. I'm not saying thus saith Jerry O'Brien. That leaves us with 49%. Out of the 49%, we see a sifting. A sifting in the body of Christ of that 49%. And we see a bulk of that 49% are living their lives, although they do go to church and they are claiming Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're living their lives from a secular worldview, not a biblical worldview. Because you can look at a person, you can examine the things that they are going after in life, and you can dis determine where their heart's desires are. Because the scriptures tells us that the the, uh, a, person, what a person is pursuing reveals where their desire is. And we can see in the body of Christ that many are pursuing education, many are pursuing, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, making sure their kids get an education, pursuing their jobs, and they're letting their responsibility to the kingdom fall to the wayside. That's who I'm speaking to today is the body of Christ, that 49% that is left. We have to readjust how we are seeing. we got to put the glasses on so that we can see the Word of God and be willing to look into this mirror of God's Word and let it reveal to you where you really are spiritually conditioned with Him. Every one of us have to do this. I bared my heart last Sunday uh, about my repentance and about God uh, uh, coming to me and, and, and uh, really convicting my heart on some things. You know, I'm a preacher and I'm, I, I've been uh, very, very cautious in reading the Word and studying the Word every day. You can ask her, you know, and, and, and sitting up at night praying and fasting. Fa I fasted for six months myself. I didn't ask you to do it. We did it as a congregation for 21 days. I continued for six months, not so that I can boast and brag, but so that I can hear this. And let me tell you, when you seek God like that, you better be ready to see what he shows you. You be ready to receive what he shows you. And you would think, yeah, God's going to show me this, this, and this, and you already did. He took me right back to my personal life and said, let me show you this. Before I can show you this, and these revelations, and before I can give you these instructions and these uh, 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 directives, I've got to show you this. You've got to take care of this. There's some bitterness here. This, I, wait a minute, Lord. I didn't fast for all that. I fasted for, the, but we've got to be willing to do that. And I'm telling you, you've got to be willing to do that. And I'm telling you as your pastor, those of you that have determined that, uh, that I am your spiritual overseer and your pastor, I'm telling you that you've got to do this. I'm asking you to hear what the Spirit says to you today. Hear what the Spirit says to you in this season. I'm asking you not to hear what I didn't say and hear what the Spirit said. I'm asking you to, to uh, filter everything you hear through the love of Christ for one another. That means that the love that God has bound you and I together in goes deeper than our denominations. It goes deeper than the color of our skin. It goes deeper than what party we are elected to, uh, 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 we're signed up for uh, as far as political. It goes to the core of who we are. We are the body of Christ, and we owe allegiance to each other before we owe allegiance to anything else because we are the body of Christ. Man, I wish I would have wrote that down. That, thank you, Lord. That was good. I needed to hear that. I, and to do this, to get, go back and make this adjustment to see our lives in a biblical worldview and get away from a secular worldview, uh, uh, we have to go back 
to answer some simple questions from the beginning. We have to revisit some things and rebuild some old ways places. It says in you know, Isaiah chapter uh, 58, it says, They that shall be of thee shall build the old ways places. They shall raise again the foundations of many generations and call the repair of the breach and restore past dwelling. That's what it means. They that shall be of thee means some of us. Some of us are going to be called to go and rebuild these foundations so that from the past generation so that the future generation can stand upon them. And that's what I'm attempting to do tonight. When we look at the, the basics of the gospel, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is why did Jesus come to earth? Why did God think it's so important that he would leave his throne, come down here and put a veil of flesh upon him and live in this body in this life and put himself to through these things. Why? Well, the Bible is specific. It does tell us. To give us eternal life. That's what he said. To give you and me eternal life. Because he loved us so much that he did not want to say, no, they're flawed, and I'm going to do away with them and create something else. I love them so much that I'm going to go get them. You see, Adam saw his wife dying, and he said, give me a bite, I'm going to die with you. But Jesus saw his bride dying and said, no, you're not going to die, I'm going to die for you. And that's why he came, is to die for us so that we don't have to die. He is God. He said, I'll raise myself up again. <laughs> so we got to recognize Jesus came to give us life. How did he do it? Well, he did it by going out, preaching, teaching, healing the sick, and giving his life as a sacrifice. That's how he did it. That's how he gave us eternal life. Now, I'm being very general and broad about this because I got a short time to get it out there. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 tells us how he did it. He said, and I'll just quote this. and You can put it up there. Mark. Uh, oh, is it, there's nobody back there. Okay, well, uh, Mark 1, 14 said that Jesus said, after John the Baptist had been put in prison, Jesus came in Galilee preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. He said the gospel of the kingdom of God is at hand. He came out preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't come out preaching and say, I'm here to heal you. I'm here to, to, uh, to give you whatever your heart's desire is. He came out and the verse, first thing he said is I'm here to declare that the kingdom of God is here. And that was proclaimed in the emphasis that you can pursue it if you want. It goes on and it says that our job, your job and my job, is to be a witness of the gospel by living it. That's what your job and my job is. He proclaimed the gospel. Your job and my job is to live this that he has claimed to be a witness. Your job and my job is to do what Jesus did. Your job and my job is to preach his gospel. No, you heard me right. It's not the preacher's job to preach it. It's your job and my job to preach the gospel. I've had so many people say, I don't know what I'm called to do. So many people said, I don't know where to start. Right here is where you start. You live the word and you begin to live this word to be a witness. That's your job. You say, well, you know, but I'm talking about, you know, whether I should be a preacher, whether I be a, a, a prophet or, or, or a church worker. No, no, no. Listen, listen. That is not what you're called to do. That is the direct function of you doing what you're called to do. You'll just flow in these things if you do what God called you to do. He said, you're called to preach the gospel. Through the witness of your life, each one of us are. That was my job before I became a preacher. I believe the Lord said we're going to have to make him a preacher because he won't shut up doing it. <laughs> and we look at this, and Paul said this. I love this. 
I, I kind of rephrased this of how Paul said it. He said, we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. He said, we as ambassadors, we as ambassadors, you've got to watch there. We as ambassadors of Jesus Christ are called to offer eternal life to sinners if they will come to Christ for salvation. Now listen, that's the whole of the gospel. You say, but I don't know the Bible. All you got to do is know that. That you are called as an ambassador of Jesus Christ to compel people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, 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 you know, as a, you know, offer eternal life to them. Say, you can have eternal life. That's what you and I are called to do. As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we are called to offer to the sinner salvation if he will come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That's what we're called to do. Goes on to say, he says, the, 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 I put out these questions to ask myself as I was studying this. How do we call them to respond? What is it that we're looking for them to do when we call them to receive Jesus Christ? You see, there's more than just accepting Christ. Because what we say, we say, well, Lord, I accept you as Lord and Savior. There's more than that. I know what it says in, in the 10th chapter of uh, Romans. It says, all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I know what it says in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts when the scripture says uh, that, that, that Paul said to the uh, uh, Roman guard at the, at the jail, uh, re receive the uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. Call on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved is what he said. Leaves in the emphasis that that is all you got to do. But you got to go on and read what Paul said to that uh, guard. He went on to explain what that meant. There is a reaction that God is requiring you and I to participate in. There is a reaction that every sinner that we call to repentance. And that's it. The rain is coming. Let it rain. The latter rain is coming. Give the Lord a hand. So the question is, how do we call sinners to respond? How should they respond? Here's the answer. We should call them to repentance. To repentance. You see, it is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and repent. This is the fundamental worldview that we are supposed to have. This is our job, is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ through the repentance of sin. We don't want to talk about sin no more. There are churches in this county that have taken the, uh, 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 the cross down. Uh, they have taken the word sin out of their sermons. They won't even talk about the blood and the sacrifice. It's all about what God's going to do for you. It's all about coming and getting a pep rally and patting you on the back and burping you so that you can feel good about yourself and go out of here. When we look at Jesus' preaching, he wasn't worried about what the disciples felt about him. Man, Christians in today's culture would not last a week in Je Jesus' ministry. I mean, he looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He said, get behind me, devil. You're a devil. Get behind me. I mean, if I called some of you a devil and I meant it, you'd leave. See, Bob said he'd leave. I won't call him a devil. I'm just telling you the truth. The scripture says that we call them to turn from sin in order to receive the newness of life. That's what the scripture says. Said it there in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. You see we read 14. 14 says Jesus came out after John the Baptist. And you can read the same story going to chapter uh, 4 of uh, the book of Matthew. Because they both recorded this. But Jesus came out after John the Baptist went into prison 
and he declared, behold, and started preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then verse 15, he said, the time is at hand, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance through repentance, listen, through repentance and believing in the gospel. So there is an action that we have to put to our cry. There is an action that we have to put to our commitment. And that action is called repentance. And when we look at this and we see uh, uh, this, Luke chapter 24. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 24. Jesus' very first sermon here in the planet. Here in the planet. He came out. That was his first sermon public sermon right there when he came out and declared it he came out to the masses in the community and declared the kingdom of God is at hand and it is now time to preach the gospel of repentance and believing in the gospel that's what he said his last message that he preached According, this ain't Jerry O'Brien chapter 24. This is what it says in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Repent. He said that, he said, listen, the very first verse uh, before this, 46, says that don't you know what I preach to you? That the Messiah must be uh, uh, crucified, hand over to sinful men, and be crucified, died, and raised again on the third day. Why? That the gospel, right there, 47, that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached. Who's supposed to be preaching it? Us, not the preachers. This, he was speaking to everybody that was there. It wasn't just the 12 disciples. It was other people there. He said, this, I'm sending you out. I did all of that. So that I would have the authority. This is what it says in the last chapter, chapter 28 of Matthew. Uh, going along with this. He said, I did all of this. So that the Lord, the, uh, 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 God the Father, the Father has now given me all authority in heaven and on earth. And then he goes on to say, now I'm giving it to you. Now go and preach the gospel to every living creature. They that believe and are baptized shall be saved. He says it here. That the repentance and remission of sins may be preached in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of somebody else. Beginning here at your house, he said, Jerusalem. If you are a Christian, you are a born again Christian. I don't care if you are just seconds old. You are called right out of you. You're like a snake coming out of uh, uh, the, uh, the egg. When you come out of the egg, when the snake comes out, if a venomous snake comes out of the egg, the minute his head sticks out, he is dangerous. He is armed. He is poisonous. You and I, the minute we get saved, we be endowed with the power and authority of God. He said, now I give that authority and I give that power to you. You are dangerous. The devil is scared of you. He don't want you sharing nothing. He said right out of the bat, right out of the gate, you're called to preach the remissions of sins. You are called to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and believe in him that he is the Messiah. And then preach repentance of sin. Listen, don't just tell your friends, listen, you got to call upon the name of the Lord and he'll save you. You see, you're giving them in the impression that that's all they got to do. There is something else they got to do. They got to turn from themselves. They got to turn from their old ways and leave it behind. They got to take up their cross and they got to put it upon their lives. They got to allow Christ's life live through them by them studying this and just doing what Jesus did. 
That is being the witness. And then when they come up to you and they say, let me ask you something. How in the world was it that you were able to get through this? You can say, it was because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within me. And he'll do the same for you. If you will receive him and repent from your sins, repent from your old ways, he'll do it for you. Don't tell him, well, you just got to give your life to Christ. Here's what they tell him. You got to give your heart to Christ. Listen, he don't want your heart. He don't want that heart. Now, that's not Jerry O'Brien. Here's what he said. He said, give your life to me. He don't want to change, and he don't want your old stinky, dirty heart. Uh, we are told in the scriptures, the heart of man is deeply deceitful, sinful. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's what the word says. Why would he want that heart? He ain't going to throw that thing away. He said, you give me your life. This is a life exchange. It's not a, a personality exchange. It's a life exchange. And when we give our lives to Christ and he comes and lives with us, he takes that old stony heart away and gives you a heart of flesh, which is of his heart. He gives you his heart, and the desires that he has becomes your desire. I mean, is it a wonder when you first got saved, you didn't want to go back in the bar no more? Not because you didn't enjoy drinking, but it's because you enjoy drinking from him more than you did what you were in the bar. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what happened to me. I'm sorry, I'm probably blowing him away in the, in the media room with the sound and trying to keep it down for the, uh, uh, for the TV viewers. But I got something to shout about. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited today. Oh, the Lord done whooped me all over my house. And he's been doing it for about three or four weeks. And, and now it's got to the point that it feels good. <laughs> you got to whip you till you like it. <laughs> but anyway, I got to get back to preaching. Uh, what he said here, this is Jesus' last message. As he is ascending up in heaven, he's given these instructions to his disciples, all of them that were there. He said, now go. I did all this so that I can give you the authority that you can go and preach that the repentance of sin, the repentance and remission of sin, the remission of sin means turning away from sin. True repentance means that you have turned away from your old life of sin. And you are living, studying, serving God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, when we are living and serving and, and pursuing God, you're going to fall. You're going you're gonna to be uh, tripped up. You're going to find yourself wandering off the path. But if you are searching and seeking him, he will not let you go astray. It's kind of like a buoy thrown in the water. You got enough rope to keep you flowing with the waves when they get higher. But if you get too far away, it pulls you back. That's our promise. So this is not just my message. The last thing Jesus told you to do is preach the gospel. Tell people. Why he came. He came to give them eternal life. He didn't come so they can be happy. Ain't no, ain't no worry in the Bible. That, that's not biblical. He came to give us joy. It's the difference between joy and happiness. You see, happiness is controlled by your environment and your conditions and your circumstances. You get up on Sunday morning and it's zero degrees out there and you go out there and your tire is flat, you are anything but happy. You're not happy. You get bad news from the doctor, you're not happy. Somebody steal your money, you're not happy. Somebody mess with your wife, you're really not happy. But you can still have joy. Because you see, your joy comes from the Lord. In all of these circumstances and situations that look ugly and scary and threatening, we can still have joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what you got to preach. That's what you got to tell people. I understand people are suffering. God uses their suffering to get their attention. And God will send you to them in their time of need to say, listen, 
I want to throw you a life raft. My life. They'll come to you many times if you're living your life and you've been around them long enough and you're truly living your life like this. They'll come around you when they're crashing and burning and their life is falling apart. And they'll say to you, like they said to me, the year that my wife was uh, going through uh, 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 cancer for the first, uh, uh, that whole part of the year. My mother that same t- at the same time was going through lung cancer. My spiritual mother died. And all of these things were happening all at one time. And it seemed like every proper security that I had in life was being removed and, and, and challenged and I'm standing my ground I'm believing upon the word I don't understand what's going on I tell the Lord I love you anyway we stooped down the night that they told us and told her they said what you have if it's what we think you have you're going to have an uphill battle Reverend John and Reverend Beth was there Reverend Jackie and Reverend, uh, 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 no, no, actually, Karen, you were there when they told us that, all the way back. They said, if this is what we think it is, you're going to have an uphill battle because it looks like it's ovarian cancer. And we sat there like, we didn't want to hear that. I said, oh, man, we were numb. We went home, and we sat there that night, like everybody that getting that news. And I, she was sitting in the chair, and I just... I said, we got to call out to the Lord. We ain't going to be able to handle this by ourselves. I got up. I walked over to her. I kneeled down on the floor. And I laid my head over her lap. And we just started praying. And I said, God, I started praying like everybody prays, you know. I started praying, you know, Lord, you know, I don't know what's going on. I need your help. And then all of a sudden, my whole demeanor changed. It was as if I wasn't praying. It was as if something raised up inside of me began to speak that I'd never heard. And it said, God, your word said that you hear the prayers of the righteous. Your word says that your ear is near to their cries. Your word says you deliver them from trouble. Your word says that you have delivered them from fear. I'm calling upon you according to your word, Lord. You see what's going on. I'd like to ask you to do something, Lord. You are God. You said you'd prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. I said, Lord, I would like for you to fill this spiritual coliseum with all of the host of heaven because I got something I got to say. And I want the whole host of heaven to hear this. And then I I said that out loud, and she heard me say it. And then I got quiet. And in my eye, in my mind, I saw all of the cherubims. I saw all the angels and seraphims, uh, uh, the gathering in this great coliseum. And I heard them coming in like, what's going on? Who's called this meeting? I've never seen anything like this go on before. And I heard the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit say, shh, just be quiet and sit. And they all sat down, and I heard the Lord say, Now, Jared, now, what is so important that you would have me call a host like this together? I said, Lord, bear with me one more minute. You did it with Abraham. You did it, O Lord God, when he called upon you. Hear my prayer. I need something else from you. That's when I started speaking out loud again. She didn't hear that part. She just heard this part. Bear with me a little longer, O Lord, like you did Abraham when he sought you for the life of Abraham or uh, 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 Lot. I said, I need you to call the host of hell up here. I said, your word says you'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Now listen, people, that ain't Jerry O'Brien praying. That's something that came out of sight of me that would never came out before. I said, call them up here in this arena, up here on this grounds. I got something I got to say, oh God, and I want them to hear it. I don't want to have to repeat it twice. And then I stopped praying again. In my mind, I saw the devil in his haughtiness, just like Job said. He came before God in his haughtiness, and God said, where you been there, devil? I've been out doing my business to and fro upon the earth. God called him up there and the devil like, what are you calling me up here for? 
and all of his arrogance and all of his imps and demons were with him. He looked over and saw me at the 50-yard line. Now listen, I know I have a man of a vivid imagination, but I'm telling you, I had a conversation with the Lord. I was taken up like Paul said. I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, but I was called up in this with God. I saw this arena. God called the coast of hell. They gathered in, and he said, I see. You called me up here because of that thing right there in the middle of the yard, Jerry O'Brien. You probably figured out he's everything I told you he was. He's a liar. He's a thief. He don't deserve what you're giving him. And I heard the Spirit say, shut up. And get over there behind that table. And like the coward he is, he swung over there and they all cowered down. And then the Lord turns and says, now, Jerry, what is it that you had to say? I said, Lord, I said, the only thing I really had to say is really to you. He says, and I wanted the host of heaven to hear it. And I wanted the host of hell to hear it. This is what I began to speak out loud. I said, I just wanted to tell you that we love you. We love you more now than we ever did. And it doesn't matter what we've got to go through. It doesn't matter if my mom lives or dies. It doesn't matter if she lives or dies. We're going to serve you because you are a good God. Because your word is what it says it is. You are who you said you are. And I turned to the host of heaven and I said, and as for you, if you really understood his holiness, all of the years and and centuries and however long you've been uh, praising him, cannot even touch how holy he is. If you really understood how holy God was, you couldn't even begin to understand it. And then I turned to the host of hell and I said, as for you, you are a liar and you ain't never done nothing but to lie to me, try to kill and steal from me. And I am here to tell you, I will serve him no matter what happens. You lose any way it goes. We win any way it goes. And then I just turned to the Lord and I said, there, that's all I wanted to tell you is I love you. And we're going to keep going no matter if we can't see the way. I know that you're going to lead us and you'll be with us. And I closed my eyes and we began to weep. And as I began to weep, I saw us walking out of this uh, Colosseum and I saw the doors shut. And then I heard a roar from the stadium shouting, God is God. He is holy. He did what he said. His people will worship him in the midst of their trials, according to Job. And that's who God is. That's what God revealed. That's the God that we serve. And all that he asks is for us to be a witness us to live this life that Jesus lived, for us to repent of our past. Here's the thing, and I'm going to close with this and ask Brother Bob to come up because I do want to spend some time. I might have to preach this again on Sunday because there's just too much there. But here's what I want to say. You know how for almost three and a half years we've been calling the nation to repent. You know that. We all have. uh, Almost every preacher I know has been calling everybody to repent. And everybody that I know have been part of these prayers that we have gathered together in a corporate uh, uh, body, crying out and repenting for the sins of our nation. But I want to tell you something. That's not really what's going to change in our nation. What's going to change our nation is that we call out God and repent for our own sins. It's easy to repent for the sins of our nation and the things that our government has done that they shouldn't do. You see, because it's easy, because we can literally kind of sit back in our mental capacity and say, it's them, oh Lord, that's doing it, and we're repenting on their behalf. But until we get to the point that we take it to the personal level and realize they would have never got to where they got to if you and I hadn't repented in the first place. we got to stop saying We're repenting for them and saying we're repenting for ourselves. I want to close with the reading of the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. Here's Nehemiah's prayer. 
Nehemiah got the news from his brother coming back. And his brother said, when he said, how is the building of the new temple and the city of Jerusalem doing? He said, it ain't doing. It's horrible. It's not built. What I thought, Zerubbabel came in and built the temple. Yes, he did. He said, but everything else is falling apart now. And if God doesn't step in, it's not going to stand. It's all falling. And the scripture says that day, Nehemiah, when he heard the news, he sat down and wept. And he wept for many days. Listen, he didn't weep because the, it wasn't built. He wept because he realized on a personal level, it didn't get built and it's falling apart because I didn't do what God called me to do. The very last thing said, and here I am, worried about being the king's cup barrier. When I should have been worried about, you see, that's the sin. Having a secular worldview, his worldview of his life was he was the cup bearer for the king. But God called him to be a governor for his people. And that's what he was repenting about. Listen to his prayer of repentance. Listen to it as we close. And then I want to challenge each one of us today. Yes, we have repented. I've done this. I'm doing this now. You heard me bear my soul last Sunday that I repented because I had bitterness toward a, a people that were in our government. I still struggle with it. With God's help, I will overcome this. I continue to repent. We must never have a history with sin. We must never have a bill owed to sin. We must repent ourselves. In order to call other people to repent, we must repent. We must repent because somewhere along the line, every one of us allowed this to happen. Every one of us allowed babies to be murdered. Every one of us allowed a, 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 a divorce to become easier than getting a, 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 a drink of water. Every one of us, somewhere we allowed this. How? Because we didn't sacrifice our life to be a witness. We wouldn't speak up for righteousness. We wouldn't speak up for righteous arguments. You and I bear the responsibility on a personal level. I'm asking you to pray about this. I'm not going to ask you to do anything about it tonight. I want you to go home and I want you to meditate. Those of you that are watching, you need to meditate. You need to go and ask God this. Because listen, according to Nehemiah, it took him many days to wrap his mind around this. It said that he sat down and mourned and wept and fasted for many days. He was broken, not by it not being built, but by his own sin. He was captured by his own sin of being caught up in a secular worldview. God, how did I do this? I got so caught up and wanted to become a success, be the main man over the king's security. And I let it all fall apart. We all need to weep and over our nation's demise, over our nation's moral calamity. We all need to weep because we are all guilty. Now, I didn't come here today to make you feel bad, but my Bible tells me as a minister, according to Paul telling Timothy, preach to them, teach them, and when necessary, rebuke them and instruct them. I'm rebuking myself. The Holy Spirit rebuked me. I have to rebuke you. Your job as a born-again Christian is to preach Jesus Christ crucified and Him raised again and their willingness to accept that and repent from their old life. Walk away from their old life. Let's worship the Lord as we go out of here. She reads this. Go ahead and read these verses, and then we'll go into something. Go ahead. Um, something that he had said Sunday that I really liked, and I just want to bring it up again. Um, 
when he was talking and he talked about the air filter of a car. And that's something daily that we can do. We, we each have a filter within us, and he, he spoke of that. And daily, we should be checking our own air filter because it's the daily walk with him, and we slip up with things. And if we're daily checking that air filter and making sure that it's all cleaned out of the crud of this earth, um, then God's going to honor that and we'll, we'll keep that slate clean with him on a daily basis and not let things slip by. And it's like when she said, well, I don't understand why you have to clean the filter so much. I said, well, it's not because you don't understand the mechanics of a car. It's because you don't understand the conditions of the world we live in. You see, because the world we live in is dirty. I don't care what state, city you go to, I don't care how pure their air is, there is some pollutants in the air. And you drive that car long enough, that air filter is going to get plugged up. Spiritually speaking, we are not just called to repent once, we are called according to Jesus to live a life of repentance. Why? Because we get our hands dirty in the world. Because the world we live in is cursed. And as we go through it, we get distracted. And every one of us, we get uh, uh, pulled away. Every one of us at times will get caught up on a detour. And we get our hands dirty. So we've got to repent. What does that mean? Turn from that sin. Turn from those perspectives. Turn from that secular worldview and readjust ourselves to see our lives from a biblical worldview. Your job as a parishioner, is to call and to call people to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and to repent. Not just call upon the Lord, but to call upon him and repent. Leave your world behind. Leave your old life behind. Because here's what the scripture said. Now listen, here's what I'll close with. Here's what the scripture says. That it's only those people that are going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Only those of us that have done that are going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Peter said it this way in 2 Peter. If the righteous scarcely make it, where would the sinner and ungodly be? Read this. Read the whole thing. Yes. Verse 4 all the way down. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your, your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. We. We, not them, we have sinned against you. You've got to get to that personal level. Both my father's house and I have sinned. I, that's what I had to say to the Lord. Lord I've sinned, you're right. I got this bitterness in me and I don't know how to get it out. I see these people who are trying to hurt my family, hurt my nation, hurt everybody that I love, and they're doing it on purpose. They're doing it willfully. It's plotted, it's premeditated. I am struggling with this, oh God. I need your help. Go ahead. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments. Listen, they have acted very corruptly against us, but we, in bitterness, and we, sin, and have acted very corruptly before our God. That's an offense to our God. Us getting bitterness over them. It doesn't matter if everything they did is, everything I said is true. Everything that I perceive is 100% true and more. If I get bitterness and I don't operate through this word according to his precepts, it is an offense. It's corruption to him. Keep going. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant's servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, 
If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. Mm, my Lord. But if you return to me yes. and keep my repent. commandments. Words, turn to me. That is repent. If you will turn away from those and turn to me. Keep going. And do them. Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens. He's still praying now. He's reminding God of what God had told them. You've got to remind yourself of what God told you in his word so it will strengthen you. He's reminding himself, I have hope because he said that if I would turn from these ways, keep going. Yet I will gather them from there mm. and, and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people mm. whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So I got caught up being the king's cupbearer. And he repents of it. I want you to go home. I want you to take this message home. And I want you to ask the Lord, reveal the contents of your heart. That's what I did. And I want you to be willing to get into God's word. That's how I saw it. I didn't see it because I'm this great spiritual somebody. I was in the word of God and a word hit me. It was in Luke chapter 24, verse 47. It said, that our job was to go and preach repentance and remission of sins. Preach Christ Jesus and him crucified and the remission and repentance of sin. I checked my life. I looked at my life and I started realizing, how can I hear from God? How can I get spiritual revelation and a biblical strategy for myself alone or for my congregation. If I don't check myself, if I don't get rid of this bitterness, get rid of, and I don't watch myself, the Lord said, don't even joke with it. When you hear somebody talking about them, don't joke along with it. Because you see, I'm already dealing with bitterness. It pulls me back into it. I'm asking you to do the same thing. If our nation has any hope, if we hope to save our inheritance for our children, if we hope to save our children from living in a world that does not honor God, we'll do this. We'll stop looking left or right or behind us in front of us. We'll stop worrying about what people are saying about us. And we will look at ourselves and say, help me, oh God. Help me not to go back to the world. Help me not to get caught up into the secular worldview. Let's stand and let's sing and let's pray. Jesus. Come on, pray in the spirit while Bob, Brother Bob worships. Come on, pray. You can use the altar, you can sit back there, you can kneel, you can walk, whatever it is you need to do.